Hi everyone and welcome to How AgeWell Technology is Changing Homes of the Future and Promoting Independence for All. We're very, very excited today to have Dr. Alex Mihalides, our very own CEO and co-scientific director, to uh, deliver this webinar today. Dr. Mihalides is the Barbara Stymius Research Chair in Rehabilitation Technology at Toronto Rehab. He's a professor in the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy at the Institute of Biomedical and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Toronto, with a cross appointment in the Department of Computer Science. His research disciplines include biomedical engineering, computer science, geriatrics, and occupational therapy. And he's also an internationally recognized researcher in the field of technology and aging. Um, I'm going to kick it over to Alex uh, very quickly right now. However, before we get started, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to use the chat box uh, at the bottom of your page. You'll be able to see an option to raise your hand or to chat. Feel free to type your questions in there and we'll answer them at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation. We are recording this webinar. Thanks everyone. Alex. Great. Thank you very much, Sam. And thank you to everyone for taking the time to join us on today's webinar. As the title slide shows, today I'll be talking a little bit about the work that AgeWell is doing around changing homes of the future and pro promoting independence for all. What I want to do in my talk today is actually take more of a high level approach and really discuss uh, the field in general in terms of technology and aging, uh, the work that's happening, but also get at some of the key points that we feel um, have really prevented us from achieving a lot of the goals and objectives that we set out for this field many, many years ago. Now, I'm going to come from the perspective of obviously uh, from being co-scientific director of AgeWell, but also from the perspective of being a researcher in this area for almost the past 25 years and the lessons that I've learned and also things that I've seen happen as we move the field forward. So let's get going. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the background here or talk about the demographics. I think we all know this. We have all seen uh, and heard of various things such as the rising tide, the gray tsunami, et cetera. And really, at the end of the day, what people are trying to get at is that globally, we're seeing a change in our demographic. We're all getting older. We're having more people living longer with various diseases and impairments. For example, it's very typical nowadays to see people living with such things such as Alzheimer's disease for you know, 15, 20, 25 years plus. And this is obviously causing a challenge for all of our healthcare systems. And really the key message that's being trying to get across here is how are we gonna care for these individuals as we move forward and how are we gonna provide the right resources and tools that are needed, not only for our healthcare systems in the traditional sense to, to care for these individuals, but also for the families, the spouses, the sons and daughters, and the other caregivers that are spending endless amount of time right now providing support and care for these older adults. However, one of the key messages I do want to get across and something we don't realize is Canada is going to be considered one of the super aged countries by the year 2050. If you look at this map in the, color, in the countries in red, these are those countries. Now typically when we talk about super aged countries and countries that are having, you know, we're going to have large demographic sh uh, shifts in terms of their populations. We always think about Asia and Japan and others. And what, what many of us don't realize is Canada is right up there as well. So again, this is something that's going to be very pertinent to Canada um, and something that we need to start dealing with as, as quickly as possible. However, the good news is, as our NCE name indicates, is that we feel everyone can age well. And what do we mean by aging well or healthy aging? It's essentially the ability to remain independent, to do what we want to do, where we want to do it, and how we want to do it, no matter what our age may be. Furthermore, within the age well network and within the field here in Canada, as we're starting to see more and more, is we believe that everyone can age well, even in the face of disease and parent disability. In fact, even a person with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, or physical impairment can live a very healthy and active lifestyle, but with the right intervention supports in place. Now, obviously, within AgeWell, the intervention we're talking about is technology or technological-based solutions. So when we look at the area of technology and aging, the work that's happened, it's actually a, you know, a good news, bad news kind of situation. The good news is that there's actually been a significant amount of research that's been conducted over the past couple decades that have shown that technology can play a significant role in supporting older adults. So you see here some examples of some commercially available technologies which are starting to make their way into the care and support of older adults. 
such as tablets, which are being used to provide cognitive training, uh, social connectedness, and other applications. Obviously, there's gaming systems out there. Here's an example of the Nintendo Wii. This is actually a picture taken from a virtual bowling league that was set up across Canada that allowed seniors in nursing homes and other facilities to connect not only with other residents to play this game, but also with residents from other facilities across the country. And if you actually look at the research of this type of uh, project and other similar ones that use gaming, there's actually quite a number of studies that have shown significant improvements in the health and wellness and overall support of these individuals. And you see in the lower picture there, a picture of a wearable. You know, we can't really go anywhere these days without talking about wearables. All of us have some kind of device on us these days, whether it's our mobile phone, a smart watch or something else. And again, research has shown that the use of these wearables can actually have a significant impact on lives of older adults. However, the bad news to all this is the adoption, the ongoing use of these technologies. So while there's a significant amount of research out there that shows these technologies can play a role in supporting older adults, there's also a, a, a fair amount of literature that shows that after the research is done, adoption and traction of these technologies is quite poor. In fact, even in those studies where perhaps they have given the technology to the older adult or the caregiver to use after the fact, the research shown that you know, 70, 90% of these devices are actually abandoned at the end of the day. So really the message here to start my presentation is, the good news is there is strong potential for technology support healthy and active aging. The research has shown it. There are some commercial successes that, that we've all seen that I'll talk about later on. But there is a big but, and there is a big however here. And that is the fact that as a field, we need to do better. We need to do better in terms of moving the research from the labs themselves and into the hands of the people who actually need them. We need to do a better job of connecting with industry and other key stakeholders to ensure that we're developing the right technologies and producing solutions that are going to be effective and truly needed by older adults and caregivers themselves. And what this has resulted in something that we call an age wall failure to launch. And that is the fact that while we see a lot of research devices, a lot of technology being developed in the academic institutions, there are very few solutions that are available in the marketplace. And this is especially true in Canada. The technologies and solutions that are available have been reported by older adults themselves as being too expensive and often too difficult to use. So the question first we need to look at is why is it like this? And this is a key part of what we're doing with an age well, as we'll talk about in a few moments and also in the technology and aging field in Canada and internationally. We need to understand where are we going wrong, why are we not producing technologies that are effective, and then try to solve those problems moving forward. So on this slide, I've listed three reasons, which again have mainly come from my own experience within this field, but also from research that we are doing within the network itself. First and foremost, the needs of older adults are complex, and even more so in the face of specific impairments and diseases. I'm still amazed by the number of people who come and talk to me about their solutions or technology developing. And really, they feel that the older adult population is homogeneous. They don't realize that older adults are unique across themselves, especially in the face of different diseases or impairments. And the fact that you know, we can do a one-fit-all solution in other areas does not apply in this particular field. In fact, many of the older adults have often said this to us. You know, a key message they want us to get across to our developers into our students or our partners, is that when you've seen one senior, you've seen one senior. And that's an important message that we need to carry through the entire research field. The second point, which relates to the first one, is still more often than not, we do not see older adults being part of the projects. We talk a lot about user-centered design, participatory design, or whatever terminology we want to use. But at the end of the day, often the older adult really is still just an afterthought, or is really there in, as, as a token expert in order to get their feedback. This is something that needs to significantly change and change very quickly if we're going to continue to grow and be successful in this area. And finally, and perhaps the most importantly from a research and development perspective, is there's still very much a silo mentality in our field, which has resulted in poor outcomes. What I mean by this is that we still have the engineers working separately from the occupational therapists who are working separately from the caregivers, who are working separately from the family physicians, and often, as I mentioned before, the older adults are nowhere in this picture. One of the key things we need to do is push for the notion of transdisciplinary working. And this has been a key aspect of our age-old network, and that has really helped to move our research forward. It's breaking the silos down and ensuring that all the expertise that are needed are being represented in the projects themselves. 
Now, another complication of this whole thing is say we figure out some of the other points. Say we start to understand the needs of older adults more in depth. We start to include them in the research. We start to break down those silos. The problem is it's a moving target. And this is actually quite a large debate currently in the technology and aging field. Who are we actually designing for? Are we developing technologies for the current day older adults? Or are we developing for the future older adults? Because let's face it, if we're looking at things such as smart homes or robots or artificial intelligence, all topics I'll discuss later on in my talk, that's not going to be ready anywhere from the next five to 10, maybe 15 years. At that point, it's going to be different demographic of older adults. Older adults and their caregivers are becoming more tech savvy. They're going to have greater expectations of the integration of technologies, not only in their daily lives, but in their, in their health and wellness as well. So we need to ensure that we actually strike a very delicate balance right now to not only focus on the current day older adult and caregiver market, but their future one as well. Essentially, at the end of the day, we need to do things differently. We need new ways of thinking and new ways of doing in order to move beyond this typical technology for older adults. I'm sure we all recognize this. This is your personal emergency response system. It's either a pendant or a bracelet or other type of device that an older adult wears. If they fall, if they become injured, if they become sick, they need to push the button. And this will connect them to a live operator. Now, if you look at the business of technology and aging, if you look at all the products that are out there, this would be considered one of the most successful products ever developed and marketed to older adults. However, from a usability perspective, from a stigma perspective, it's actually one of the poorest. You talk to the companies that make these technologies themselves, they're the first ones to say 70, 75% of their clients never wear the button. Now, when you talk to the older adult and say, well, why aren't you wearing the button? Often it comes down things around stigma. I don't want my loved ones to know there's something wrong with me. I don't want to explain to my friends why I'm wearing this device. Furthermore, 80 to 85% of the clients who wear the button never actually activate it when they need to. And again, it comes down to things around stigma, but also usability. Often the person is too injured or unconscious to activate it. Sometimes they reply with things such as, well, I know if I push this button, it's a one-way ticket out of my home to a long-term care facility. And so these are things we need to address. We need to actually disrupt the way that we're currently doing things and move away from this current model. We need to disrupt the way to develop technologies very much the way it happened in other industries. For example, as soon as a company such as Apple came out with the first smartphone and convinced everyone that we want to do a lot more and just make phone calls on our phones, everyone else had to change suit or be left behind. The notion that we have in age well is that we need to do the exact same thing. And that brings us to the part of doing things differently. Age well was brought together in order to become one of the first Canadian networks to bring together a broad range of stakeholders to develop solutions to healthy aging. The goal of AgeWell was to bring together researchers, trainees, stakeholders, and other key partners in order for us to all work together to break these silos down and have a better understanding of what's going on. This infographic on the screen, I'm not sure how it's displaying online, but essentially shows the sheer number of people that are involved in this field right now moving forward. In our first four years, if you look at the number of researchers and trainees and stakeholders involved, it's well over a thousand people that we're all supporting in some way. This is from across 40 different institutions. In terms of partners, industry partners, government partners, community-based partners, we're up to approximately almost 300 of these partners and organizations all involved intimately in the development of new technological solutions for older adults. But perhaps most amazingly is the number of older adults and caregivers themselves that be involved, over 4,500 in our first four years. Now, these are not older adults that, again, are just afterthoughts. These are not individuals who show up to a meeting and we never see them again. These are older adults and caregivers and stakeholders that are intimately involved in various aspects of our network, from being part of research projects to reviewing projects that are being submitted and helping us make our decisions on what we're going to invest in. So what is AgeWell's mission as a network? We are not here to develop the technologies themselves. We are here to develop and inspire a community of researchers, older adults, caregivers, partner organizations, and future leaders to accelerate the delivery of these solutions in order to make a meaningful difference in the lives of Canadians. And that inspiration part is a really key aspect of what we're trying to do. Yes, we provide funding. Yes, we provide support in various ways. But what we really want to do is ensure that we motivate the field and organize them in such a way that they can overcome some of the barriers that I spoke about before. 
So how do we do this? Well, at the center, obviously, is the network, the backbone of the network itself and the structure being provided in order to support the work that we're doing. Surrounding the age one network are our team members, our partners, and our end users. In terms of the team members, it's very interdisciplinary. We have engineers, clinical scientists, social scientists, computer scientists, gerontologists, et cetera. And what we do is we provide the mechanisms and support for these individuals to come together, leave their silos, and come together with a common goal and endpoint. In terms of the end users, we ensure that everything we do is user driven. We do not develop solutions because it's a cool technology. We do not develop solutions that are not going to have a real world application. And this is really at the essence of everything we do, involving the users and stakeholders in order to come up with cost-effective solutions and products that are gonna be attainable and equitable. Finally, our partners are critical. They're the ones that work with our researchers in order to move things out the door, out of the research labs into the hands of people that need them. But in return, what do we do for our partners? We provide them with research capacity. We provide them with the opportunity to have effective collaboration across the country. A partner that joins AgeWell is not just a partner of one single university, but is a partner with all 40 institutions that are part of our network. We have partners that currently are not in the older adult marketplace, but they feel they should be. So they come to us for that market knowledge and to help them look at this new emerging marketplace. And finally, the result of this is helping Canadian companies, whether large, medium, small, or even a startup, to be glo globally competitive in this field. As I mentioned, a key aspect of AgeWell is breaking down the silos and bringing different disciplines together. Right now, we have over 30 disciplines represented, and I'm sure that number has probably gone up since I put this slide together, all working together. But one of the key things we do within AgeWell and within the field in Canada, and Canadians are actually very good at this, is merging traditional fields related to aging, such as gerontology, sociology, et cetera, with emerging ones. For example, Many of our projects that we're currently supporting bring together things from artificial intelligence, cognitive computing, and other fields that typically were not part of the aging community. And this has resulted in not only really innovative research, but in more effective solutions. So what is AgeWell currently developing? At a very high level, I would say, you know, across the 90 some odd products that we're developing, a third of them are related to technologies or solutions that are there to support the older adults themselves across a variety of areas and see some examples on the screen here. A third of them though are really trying to support the development of our technologies, trying to understand what the older adults want from technologies. How are caregivers going to use these as tools within their toolkit to support their loved ones? And finally, the other third of the projects are about, well, what happens to these innovations once they leave the labs and the research teams? How do they actually get out there in the marketplace? What are some of the ethical, cultural, and social implications of the technology that are being developed? Especially those that are applying some more sophisticated approaches, such as robotics or artificial intelligence. What I wanna do now is turn my attention to what I feel are gonna be very disruptive areas of research to bring up promising solutions in the home. And specifically, I wanna focus on three key areas within the H1 network and the technology and aging field in Canada and that's smart homes, robotics, and big data. What I want to do is talk about each one of these briefly right now and actually show you some examples of technologies that are being developed. So let's start with smart homes. When we talk about a smart home in age well in this field, we're not talking about a home that just adjusts your temperature or turns your radio to your favorite station when you come home or turns your lights off at night. We're talking about a home that understands the context and the needs and the wants and the preferences of the older person themselves and provides that assistance accordingly. Essentially providing the, just the right time uh, help whenever the person needs it in order to ensure they can complete whether it's an activity of day living or taking their medication. Some examples of technologies we're developing in terms of smart homes and age well include technology support uh, people through daily activities. So for example, automated prompting systems. We're developing projects and technologies that can monitor activity levels and determine patterns of living for individuals. And from that information actually detect, and as I'll show later on, predict what may happen to the person. And then we're also working on more traditional types of technology that measures health parameters. However, with an age well, we're putting a different spin on these more traditional technologies. As you can see in this video, which I hope is playing and working for everyone, 
you'll actually see that we've even technologies that embed sensors into furniture. So in this particular video, whether you can see it or not, what's happening is we have an individual sitting on a sofa watching television. And at the same time, we're getting a live ECG from that person without any types of sensors or technology on that person whatsoever. All that's being used right now is a couple of sensors that are embedded to the sofa, and then obviously a lot of signal processing algorithms being developed as well. But what this technology shows is that the power of a smart home and the work that we're doing here is that we can combine different features and different types of data to understand what's going on. So imagine taking this type of technology that's bent into a sofa and putting it into a set of stairs or onto a toilet or onto the floor. So as a person goes about their daily activities and their daily business, we're getting their heart rate, their blood pressure, their respiration rate, et cetera, as part of their natural activities. At the same time, we know the person has just climbed a set of stairs and that's why their heart rate is elevated, as opposed to sitting on the sofa and having an elevated heart rate or blood pressure, which may indicate something's actually going wrong with the person. Let's talk about robots now. We actually have a significant amount of work in AgeWell and in the field in general globally that's looking at the role of robots within the homes of older adults. Here's examples of two robots that are being developed within our network. On the one side, we have a social robot named Ed, and on the other side, we have a cognitive robot named Brian. I'll talk a little bit more about the social world I'll show you video in a second, but essentially what that does is supports older adults through basic activities they live in. As you'll see in a moment, this particular robot was developed to support older adults' dementia through meal preparation. Brian and other cognitive robots are being also developed by researchers in AgeWell are there to support them through various other types of activities. In this picture you see here, Brian is actually playing a game with this particular senior. So in this particular case, they're playing the card matching game where you flip various cards over and once you get pairs, you set them aside. Brian has actually been used for other types of uh, cog uh, cognitive activities as well in gaming. For example, a different version of this robot is also used to call bingo numbers in a local nursing home here in Toronto. Now, before I go on, I just want to address one point. A question I always get asked at this stage with robots as well, this is all great, but shouldn't a real person be playing games with older adults? Shouldn't they be the ones socializing with our seniors? And the answer is absolutely yes. But for all of us who spent any time in a nursing home in a care facility, or even as a caregiver ourselves, we know that we're already at our wits end trying to get these individuals up out of bed, fed, dressed, medicated, and kept safe. At the end of the day, a lot of times the staff in these facilities don't have the time to sit down and play a game of cards or to call up bingo numbers as much as they want to. But these are the kind of activities and gaps that robots can fill very, very nicely. Robots are very good and very patient at completing these different activities and again can be used as a tool for the caregivers themselves in order to get through their days and provide the best care possible. Now, what I'm going to show here is a video of the other robot and hopefully again this plays. But what you're going to see here is that robot providing assistance to an older adult with dementia through the task of making a cup of tea. So what you saw there are two examples of a robot prompting this individual. In fact, this is a real person dementia, actually quite severe dementia. And in the first case, you saw the robot just provided a verbal prompt. That is because the robot using artificial intelligence actually learns about the preferences and the capabilities of, that, of this individual person. In the next step, you saw that the robot actually played a video on its little screen there where the face is. That's because again, over time, the robot learned that for this person, for that particular step, the person needed more of a video demonstration to get through the task. Now, one of the key things we're doing with AgeWell is trying to understand, well, how do we actually make robots a reality? How do we actually get them to the homes of older adults themselves? And how do we make them affordable? So there's actually a team of researchers across AgeWell Network that's exploring that exact aspect. Working with some industrial partners, we're trying to figure out how do we actually make the robot itself as inexpensive as possible through new techniques such as cloud-based computing. And the goal there is how do we take all the software and hardware off the robot itself, put it up into the cloud, and therefore the robot itself just becomes another actuator. It becomes like any other sensor or screen or audio speaker, and that's the way this system can be provided. 
Now, the final part I want to talk about is big data. Now, we hear a lot about big data in the media and the news, and it's probably, you know, being a bit hyped. But we still feel with an age old big data can actually be quite disruptive and really result in some really innovative solutions to keep older adults in their own homes. And that's because more and more, our homes are looking very similar to what's on this screen. It's, our homes are becoming a series of sensors and actuators and devices that in some way or form are collecting data about ourselves and what we're doing. Whether they're bed sensors, motion sensors, water sensors, our smartphones, or eventually robots, thousands of data points are being collected us on a daily basis, whether we know it or not. The question is, what can that data do for us? Well, from a supportive perspective and a good application of this in the support of older adults, we can actually develop data sets that look similar to this. This is a data set from one of our collaborators in the network out of Oregon Health Sciences University, where they collected motion sensor data, so a motion sensor in each room of a, of a person's home, over a three year period. And what this radial plot shows is so from the very top of the plot is, uh, is 0 hundred hours all the way back up to 2400 hours, so essentially a clock is you see the sensor firings for each motion sensor within the rooms of, this, of these individuals' homes. So very quickly, you can see a pattern of living. You can see that maybe from about 11 p.m. to about 7 a.m., the person's asleep and they're relatively quiet. And then about 7 a.m. for the next hour, they're doing their morning routine and having breakfast. Perhaps then they go out for a little walk as there's not much activity in the house. They come back and so on. So this type of data can actually be very, very powerful just in this form. In fact, there's actually quite a amount of research out there that shows that looking at people's activities and their patterns of living and changes in those patterns can actually be more indicative of a change in health and wellness than traditional health indicators. For example, you may take this kind of data and all of a sudden see that the person's very, very, very restless at night. You may see that they're going to the bathroom twice as many times in a day, which may indicate something like a urinary tract infection. Or you may see that they're not going to the kitchen at all, which means that they're not hydrating or eating properly. However, while this type of data is important, a key aspect of big data is prediction. Predicting what can happen to a person before it occurs is really the holy grail of the technology that many of us are trying to develop within the age-old network and in the field in general. So in fact, we have several projects that are happening within the field right now that's trying to do just that. How do we take a data set, like I just showed you, and predict different states? For example, how can we use data to, to predict changes in chronic conditions like congestive heart failure? How do we predict adverse events from occurring like falls or other medical conditions? In fact, we have a team at West of Simon Fraser University doing just that. We have a team here in Toronto that's looking at how do we predict dangerous behaviors like agitation and aggression among residents in our long-term care facility in order to reduce resident-on-resident -resident violence and resident-on-staff violence. And also looking at changes in cognition. So in fact, the table you see here actually shows some experiments that came out a couple years ago where after approximately about three months worth of data, using a data set very similar to what I showed you, we were able to predict who was going to develop dementia with about 85% accuracy. So imagine the powerfulness of big data and these types of predictive tools. Not as diagnostics, we're not trying to diagnose dementia, we're not diagnosing congestive heart failure. But what we're doing with these tools is raising alerts and alarms to the individuals themselves, to their caregivers, and to their healthcare team in order to take a deeper look at what's going on with this person and put interventions in place sooner so that they can remain in their homes longer. Now that I've shown you some technologies, I've shown you some key areas that Age is working in that can support older adults in their homes and ways that we can perhaps be disruptive, I want to turn my attention back to how do we actually get these things out there? Because in order to do things differently, in order to be disruptive in this field, it's more than just the technology itself. And that is what Age Well as a Network is doing. We're tackling some big questions. And specifically, as I just mentioned, what else do we need to consider in the research and development we're doing in order to ensure that the technology is moving out? In fact, Age Well has a very strong stance on this. We believe that we can build the coolest robot possible. But if we don't understand how that robot is going to be delivered to the person's home, if we don't understand how the person is going to use it, and if we don't understand the regulatory and policy landscape in Canada and elsewhere, that allow that robot to be purchased and used for that person's health, then that robot's gonna stay in the research lab. And because of that, AgeWell is taking a very holistic approach where we're looking at all three aspects, the technology, the service delivery, and the practice and policy. 
So one of the key aspects AgeWell is looking at, and this field is starting to turn more of its attention to, are the delivery models themselves. Because in fact, if you look at the majority of the technologies being developed in AgeWell and in our field, the majority of them are not medical devices. They're not implantable pacemakers. They're not things that we traditionally have seen healthcare, uh, healthcare Canada regulate. And because of that, there's actually a lot of confusion happening in this area. We need to understand how do people want to receive these technologies and what mechanisms and channels should we be using? So what we're actually starting to see is more of a trend towards more consumer-based products. Not only is this being driven by the technology themselves, but by our customer base. We're hearing from more caregivers and from more older adults who say, well, why can't I not just go into my local electronic shop or my home improvement store and purchase a fall detection system myself and install it? In fact, what we're also starting to see is once going, things going one step further. We're actually hearing cases of caregivers themselves who are tech savvy, developing their own solutions. And so this grassroots movement is going to be very, very important. Not only are we going to gain solutions from the top down as we traditionally have seen, but we're going to get solutions from the bottom up. And as a network and as a field, we need to support this. In fact, this is already happening. You look at the company like Best Buy. Best Buy, which we probably all know as one of the large big box stores for electronics where we buy our computers and our stereos from, in the United States and soon in Canada has launched their assured living system. This is a smart home service that is meant specifically for older adults and is advertised as such. In fact, down in the US, they've actually trained members of their geek squad to go out and work with seniors themselves to understand the needs from the smart home service, to install it for them, and then to maintain it moving forward. In fact, Best Buy has gone one step further. They've actually partnered with the Mayo Clinic to also provide wellness support to their older adult clients. So here's a really interesting example of a large company that's never been in the older adult space that has recognized the consumer potential for these types of technologies for older adults as a new customer base and is moving forward in it. Best Buy is not unique though. We see examples all the time. Amazon hiring a geriatrician. Amazon hired the, one of the most noteworthy geriatrics in the United States to lead their special projects division. Why? Because they're getting to the older adult marketplace. Silicon Valley goes gray inside the booming age tech industry. More and more we're starting to see a high number of startup companies and investment in these startup companies, particularly in the United States, who are focusing on the older adult marketplace. Google Home, the hands-free smart speaker assistant for the elderly. Not only Google, but Amazon as well is using their speaker-based technologies to support and interact with older adults themselves. And finally, just recently, Apple came out with their new Apple Watch version. Not only can it detect falls, but it can also detect various conditions such as AFib. The question is, what's going to happen with all these technologies as they come onto the consumer marketplace? Furthermore, what is going to be the role of us researchers and other partners that are involved in networks like AgeWell and others? as these large industry partners come on board and start to see the value of moving to this marketplace. So to finish off my last slide going forward, hopefully I've convinced you all that the time is now. Furthermore, I hope I've convinced you that AgeWell must be the leader in moving this forward and that we have been the leaders so far. However, the key message here is that being incremental in our field is no longer acceptable. We cannot slowly build upon the research findings we've had over all these years in order to move towards new solutions. We need to be disruptive. We need to change our thinking. We need to change the way we do things. And that'll be one of the only ways, in my opinion, that will really start to move our field forward. But as I mentioned before, the technology may be the easy part. We can build you a better robot. We can build you a better sensor. We can build you a better piece of software. But we, what we need to consider are those other aspects that support the technology itself. The cultural, social, ethical aspects need to be studied more. And furthermore, we need to consider and reconsider the traditional models and approaches in the design and the delivery of these future systems. Having said that, I thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to give it back to Sam, who is going to take us from here and lead us into the question and answer period. All right, thank you so much, Alex, for that wonderful presentation. We do have one question already from Tatiana, who's asking, where can I find centralized information about available for purchase products from each category, smart homes, et cetera? Right now, I have to spend hours on Google trying to understand what is available and to compare quality and price. So thank 
Thanks for that question. So unfortunately, there is no central resource. You know, there are websites that have been developed, um, but really they are meant for um, assistive technology in general, not specific to older adults. And typically the databases that have been developed tend to be very out of date. So unfortunately, you're not going to get away from having to Google these things. However, AgeWells and Network is here to support that. And we do have experts across the country, all working in various areas, not just the three that I mentioned, but a, a wide variety of technologies and solutions and services. So feel free to reach out to us and join AgeWell um, as a network in order for us to be able to connect you with the right individuals. Thank you, Alex. We have another question from Mary. Is there such a thing as voice activated access to my computer if I can't use my hands to type? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, uh, operating systems these days do come with accessibility features already built in. So um, definitely on a Mac, um, I am a Mac user, so I will say I've got a bit of a bias. Uh, Macs have that feature built in that you can easily turn on. And Microsoft Windows also does have that feature as well. Beyond that, there's actually a, a whole host of third-party solutions that you can find that allow you to access your computer and pretty much do everything you need from email to word processing, just uh, uh, primarily through voice. Thank you. Question from Carol. Can you expand on issues and solutions around policy? Um, yeah, absolutely. I wish I had my policy person <laughs> in the room right now. But, um, you know, there's a lot of issues happening in the policy world right now. And this kind of goes from high-level policy to very low level. So what do I mean by this? So for example, if we look at high level policy, Canada right now in particular is in this, this phase of developing various roadmaps or strategies. So for example, there is a dementia strategy under development. When you look at these strategies, those technology tends not to be um, really kind of visible. It may be given a couple of sentences here or there, but really not given the attention that technology probably at this point deserves as being part of that solution. So we're working at that level. In terms of low-level policy as well, you know, it's really looking at what happens at a regulatory aspect. So for example, working with Health Canada on how do you classify these new technologies coming out? Many of these technologies are being looked at maybe as a class four or even class five device, which for those who are not familiar, you know, four or five tend to be things like medical implants. Because again, they're not quite sure what to do with them. So we need to work with agencies like Health Canada to educate them in terms of what these technologies are, what they can and can't do, and how they should be regulated. In fact, Health Canada has been very, very open to this discussion, it's been really great to see. Beyond that though, there's also other policy, you know, at the local municipal levels, things like accessibility design, environmental design, et cetera, that we're all working with as well to ensure that we build solutions and communities that are as safe and accessible for seniors as possible. That's great. Thank you, Alex. We have a couple, we have a lot of questions coming up very quickly. So we'll try to get through as many as we can. We have a question about how can organizations providing services to older adults become involved in things like product testing? Yeah, so really the short answer is get involved with AgeWell. Um, if you go to the AgeWell website, you will see kind of a join us uh, button and also links to key people. Uh, th this is what AgeWell is all about. We're here to connect organizations like yourselves, um, to those who are developing the products, whether early stage research or products that are ready for commercialization and to make those partnerships happen. So, you know, that is one of the main reasons why we were funded in, this, in the first place and why we'll continue to be funded in the future. So we look forward to uh, partnering with you. And a related question, are consumer companies in Canada like Shoppers Drug Mart seeing the opportunities in service delivery for these sorts of products? Absolutely. You know, we have partners that are involved in the network um, in those different marketplaces that are seeing uh, the real benefit of getting involved in this field, but also in the benefit of offering these uh, solutions, whether present day solutions or future ones through their operations, stores, etc. So as I said, we've had some really exciting partners join uh, our network moving forward. Great. Now we have a, a, a longer question from Jeff. Could an AgeWell sponsored reference hardware platform, example, single board, ARM computer, sensors, operating system, and software plus a data hub be developed to aid bottom up technology enthusiasts? One could use it more easily uh, to source parts for development and experimentation and share the code and results. Thank, thank you, Jeff, for that, uh, that great question. Um, absolutely. Um, so right now, what we're seeing caregivers do, or people who are involved in this area, are trying to use off-the-shelf platforms such as Arduino, et cetera. 
However, you know, there is still a bit of a learning curve to do that. So, you know, being able to develop some kind of platform or backbone that can be used to develop very easy solutions um, would be really, really critical. And again, a project that AgeWell would love to be involved in and support in some way. We're actually seeing this in some ways up on the software side. So for example, we have researchers in our network um, who have been developing um, user interfaces that allows a caregiver or you know, anyone who doesn't have a technical background to really specify you know, the activities that are, assistance are required for or the tasks or steps in a particular activity. And this, by entering this in plain language, the back end, so for example, the artificial intelligence engine, it will be automatically generated. So you know, we have seen this happen on the software side, but not so much on the hardware side beyond kind of your typical platforms that we're all uh, used to seeing right now as researchers and developers. Great, we have a question, a comment and a question from Catherine. Fascinated by the description of alert monitoring devices as being stigmatizing and poorly used in an emergency, yet governments receive advocacy requests to pay for this technology. Are there any other options on the horizon that could be tested with at-risk client groups such as home care clients? Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So there is a significant amount of work that's been happening for a long time to develop um, alternative solutions. And when I say alternative solutions, these tend to be ones that do not require any kind of button to be worn or any type of manual intervention. So for example, using sensors that are installed in the environment that can automatically detect the fall, call for help, et cetera. The problem is again, you know, the, the technology that's currently out there really does have the, the corner on the market. And it is really the, one of the only few solutions that are available and that's being replicated by other companies. And because of that, because it's availability, um, you know, this is what governments are supporting right now because they don't have another alternative. Now, the problem of getting a different alternative out there is you need industry partners that are willing to partner with the researchers to move these new innovative ideas out there, which again, tends to be difficult because there's so few companies that are currently commercializing these devices. So it's, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg problem right now that we're dealing with. But, you know, I assure you there's a lot of great research that's happened to develop new and innovative products for not just fall detection, but fall prediction. And again, when it comes to falls, the prediction of the fall is the holy grail here. If we can prevent the fall from happening, then that solves a lot of our problems. We have a question from Aaron. Should we be creating systems that help people to live safely the way they want or prompt them to live their lives differently? It's a tricky ethical question, Alex. Should we be creating systems that help people to live lives safely, safely the way we want, they, what they want? Um, my honest answer has to be both. I think we have to come to it from both angles. Um, obviously, we need to understand how the person wants to live their life and where they want to live their life and develop solutions that's going to support that. But at the same time, also be realistic that, you know, not everyone's going to be able to stay in their own homes and communities for as long as possible. Um, you know, there are going to be people that are going to require specialized care, but that specialized care can be delivered and, um, and, and you know, conducted in a much better way through technological solutions. So it's really coming back to that notion of understanding your user, understand the client you're designing for, and then developing a solution that's going to best fit them again currently and in the future as well. Great, thank you. For the technologies that track people's daily activities, would people be concerned about their privacy being invaded? How do you address these kinds of concerns? So yes, people are concerned about privacy and security and, and rightfully so. Um, however, again, my own personal opinion, Noe reflects uh, the organization that I work for, is that I feel we get too hung up on privacy and security. We tend to throw that in very early on as a roadblock, which results in a technology not being developed or pursued, which really then they could truly be meaningful and innovative. You know, privacy and security is not a new area of work. It's being sorted out in other fields. It's being sorted out in other industries. It's a matter of us adopting best practices from those industries and putting them into the tech and aging space. Now, yes, we always heard here of security breaches, et cetera, but it's always kind of one of those situations you always hear of the one or two bad cases in the media, but you never hear, of, you know, the millions of other cases on a daily basis where security and privacy actually does work for people. And I think that's something we need to hold on to and really be far more opti optimistic about in our field than we have been to date. We have a question about uh, public funding. 
Do you think that the government will support part of the cost of technology such as robots as part of their aging in place uh, mantra? Depends which government we're talking about these days. Um, I hope so. You know, I hope as part of the work that we do, not only do we develop the technology, but again, take that holistic approach I mentioned. And part of that holistic approach is building the argument and the case and the evidence on why government should support these technologies. You know, that's happened in other industries of assistive technology. You know, we've proven the case for wheelchairs and walkers and other mobility devices that they're supported by various programs depending on the province they're in. We need to start doing the exact same thing for other things like robots, smart homes, et cetera. We have a question from Bath, England. I'm an early researcher in this field, working with people with dementia in particular. And in my work so far, various people with different backgrounds, OTs, computer scientists, research psychologists, carers, and people with dementia, et cetera, have told me that older adults are often wary of new technologies and can be very reluctant to use them. So while acknowledging that this risks generalizing all older adults, what are your thoughts on this sentiment and how do we approach this at age well? Again, it, it comes down to the individual. Yes, there are people who are very hesitant about technologies, not just older adults themselves, but there are, there are very, some that are very willing to take on new technology and either test it or use it as, as a new consumer product. So again, it comes back to that user-centered approach and understanding who we're designing for. If you look at the population in general, though, at least in Canada, older adults are actually one of the top adopters of new technologies like tablets and smartphones. So that whole notion, I think, is going out the window. And this, again, especially goes back to the, the case I presented before where the demographic is changing. You know, so while current older adults may be seen as resistant or hesitant to adopt new technologies, the next generation of older adults, which is coming very quickly, are already used to using smartphones as part of their daily lives. They're already used to using e-readers. They're already used to connecting with their loved ones through Skype or through Zoom or other online mediums. And so, you know, there's going to be a complete expectation from them that these are just going to be natural parts of the solutions we're developing. So I think, we, again, we got to be very careful on on determining who we're designing for and how we're designing for them. Great. We have one last question in the chat box at the moment. So uh, please feel free to type in your questions if you have some. Uh, question from Elizabeth. Going back to uh, the question and answer that you had previously about service providers, isn't there a risk of pseudoscientific knockoffs entering the marketplace? For example, we see this in, with uh, homeopathy, massage tools, and electronic devices to cure back pain. Yeah, absolutely there's a risk. You know, there, there's no denying that. If, if we move things towards a consumer marketplace, there's always going to be that risk of knockoffs and other versions of things coming out that may not be fully tested. I don't think there's a really a way of avoiding that. What we can do, though, as a net network and as a field is ensure that we collect the best evidence possible though for the solution that we're developing here um, and to ensure that people understand what those technologies can and can't do for them. Furthermore, it's going to be important also for us to develop the evidence and the data that can inform people with the choices that they make so they understand the differences. For example, a project that AgeWell undertook last year with the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario and other partners in Alberta was trying to look at different GPS technologies that are being marketed to older adults to help with wandering. Now, what we did is we did not try to say which technologies were good or bad or compare products, but we tried to develop a, a standard where every company that wanted to be hosted on a website by AgeWell and Alzheimer's Society of Ontario that looked at the different GPS solutions all had to present their information the exact same way, right? So that way, at least people can make a more informed choice of what is a good solution versus not such a good solution for, the, for their own personal case. Great, thank you. And it looks like we are all out of questions. If uh, anyone has another quick question, please feel free to type it in. Otherwise, we will be, um, we will be uh, ending shortly. So in the interim, while you're thinking of your questions, please take a look at the chat box. We have a brief five minute evaluation survey of this webinar. Tell us how we're doing, tell us how Alex is doing, whether or not these webinars are, are helpful to you as you uh, learn more about tech and aging generally. And last, uh, please do join us for our part three of our public webinar series 
It will be presented on June 11th by Dr. Frank Nopal and Dr. Rafiq Gubran uh, in Ottawa uh, about our Ottawa Innovation Hub. It's the Ottawa Sensors and Analytics for Monitoring, Mobility and Memory Hub, SAM3. And they'll be uh, telling us a little bit more about how they created the hub and the work that they're doing there. You'll find the registration link on the, in the chat box right now. All right, it looks like we have no more questions for Alex. So I'd like to say thank you very much, Dr. Mealides, for this wonderful webinar. And we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Great, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to uh, hearing from you and from uh, you joining AgeWell as a stakeholder, researcher, organization, if you're already not part of our network. Thanks very much.